Let's look at numbers in scripture. What are some numbers that are important in scripture? Stop this video for a moment and think about that. Well, sevens are important in scripture. Where do we see seven in scripture? Again, stop the video for a moment and think about that. God rested on the seventh day. Passover lasts seven days. Debts are canceled every seven years. The Israelites marched around Jericho for seven days and seven times on the last day. Seven actually appears quite a bit in scripture and I didn't realize it until I studied its use. For example, the priest sprinkled blood on the sin offering seven times before the Lord. He sprinkled blood on healed lepers seven times. On Yom Kippur, the priest sprinkled blood on the atonement cover seven times. And Elisha told Naaman to cleanse himself of leprosy by washing seven times in the Jordan River. So again, priests weren't just told to sprinkle blood. They were told to sprinkle it seven times. So it's significant. Seven is the number of completion or perfection. If you've done it seven times, that's enough. Another important number in scripture, uh, another place where we see sevens is in Revelation. In front of God's throne is the sevenfold spirit. The Lord Jesus addresses seven churches in the province of Asia. The Lamb opens the scroll with seven seals. Seven angels bring seven disasters in Revelation 8 and 9 and in Revelation 15 and 16. And a woman rides a beast with seven heads representing seven hills and seven kings. The beast is an eighth king. Twelve is another important number in scripture. Where do we see twelves in scripture? Stop the video and think for a moment about that. Well, there were 12 sons of Israel, 12 tribes of Israel, and 12 apostles. So 12 is a foundational number. That was the foundation for Israel. That's the foundation for the church. Uh, in a sense, like seven, it's a number of completeness. 40 is another important number in scripture. Where do we see 40 in scripture? Stop the video for a moment and think about that. In the time of Noah, God judged the earth by sending 40 days and 40 nights of rain. Moses fasted for 40 days when he received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Because of their disobedience, Israel wandered the desert for 40 years. Twice, Moses fasted and prayed for 40 days, asking the Lord not to wipe out the Israelites for their sin. And Jesus began his ministry for 40 days, uh, for, by fasting for 40 days in the desert, where he was tempted by the devil. So 40 is a number related to trials and testing. An important number in scripture, it only appears once, but it's very important, is the number of the beast. Revelation 13, 16 through 18, he also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. His number is 666. Commentators have wondered, really for 2,000 years, the significance of the number 666. What does that mean? Well, notice it's not just the number of the beast, it's the number of his name. One way to obtain numbers from names is by using gematria. The ancient Hebrews and Greeks did not have numerals. See, we have these numerals here, one, two, three, but those are, those are numerals that we got from the Arabs, who got them from the Hindus. Uh, the Israelites did not have those, and even people in, in New Testament times did not have numerals like those. Instead, they used their letters to represent numerals. So, for example, the Hebrews used their letters. You know, Aleph was one, Bet, Bet was two. Uh, yeah, here we have on this side. So, yeah, Aleph, Aleph is one, Bet is two, Gimel is three. And then in New Testament times, these letters were used as numerals, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, etc. Those were the numerals 1, 2, 3, 4. And so here's how they would have, here's one way to convert a name, or here's one way to, you know, to convert, uh, figure out the numerical value of a number. Uh, the number of this course, 117, would have been written as rho. Uh, so here, for example, is how they would have written numbers in those times. Uh, they didn't have 117 like we had. Instead, the number like 117 would have been written as rho, I, rho, yoda, zeta. I know it looks like pis, but it's the Greek letter. It's the Greek letter rho, which is here. The Greek letter rho is the equivalent of, yeah, rho is over here. Rho is the equivalent of r, and that's worth 100. And then the way you make a 10 is by using iota. Again, rho, iota. And the way to make a 7 is by using zeta. So they would have used 
they would have used zeta for seven. So they wouldn't have written they wouldn't have written something like this because they didn't have the numerals that we had. Those weren't didn't appear in the West until a thousand years later. In New Testament times, the way you would have written 117 is like this. Rho, iota, and then zeta, like that. Rho, iota, zeta. Okay, so how could you use gematria? Okay, so that makes sense, but how do you use gematria to find the numerical value of a name? Let's take, for example, President Truman. So what's the numerical value of Truman? Well, first, we have to take this, this name in English, in, in our own alphabet, Oops, sorry, we have to take this name that's in our alphabet and then we convert it to Greek letters. So T is tau, rho, I know it looks like a P, it's not a P, it's a rho. The U is the letter upsilon, M is the letter mu, A is the letter alpha, and N is the letter nu. So let's go ahead and add up these. So the tau, for example, tau is 300, rho is 100, Upsilon is 400. The uh, mu is up here. That's going to be worth 40. Uh, alpha is worth 1. And then lastly, the nu. The nu is worth 50. And so when you add all that up, you end up with 791. So we can be reasonably assured that Harry Truman was not the beast. Let's take my name. My name is Paul Bialek. Using Gematria, find the numerical value of my last name. Well, here's the way we do it. First, we take, uh, we take my name, which is in English, written like that's a Polish name. We convert that to, to Greek letters. So this is beta, iota, alpha. There is no Greek L. Instead, the equivalent of L is lambda. And then there are two options for E. So this is the eps. I've used the epsilon because it's a short E. Eta was a long E. But since I pronounce my name Bialak, I just went with a short E. And then lastly, we have kappa. So when we add together numerical values for, for um, when we add together numerical values for beta, and iota, and alpha, and a lambda, and epsilon, and kappa, we end up with 68. Not even close to being the beast. One candidate for the beast was the Roman emperor Nero because his name added to 666. Using Gematria, find the numerical value of his name. Well, the Latin name is Nero Caesar. The Greek form of that name is Neron Caesar. And when you add that up using Gematria like we did earlier, you end up with 1337. Well, that, that's not 666. So it, it's not the Greek form of the name. Instead, what you have to do is look at the name in Hebrew. So in the same way that there's Greek Gematria, there is Hebrew Gematria. So here's his name in Hebrew. So we've got the Hebrew equivalent of, of his name would be like this. So you've got the kof, uh, the Greek letter kof. I'm sorry, the Hebrew letter kof is here. That's worth 100. And then you've got samic, and the Greek letter samic. Uh, that would be worth, uh, samic is worth 60. And you've got resh. Resh is the Hebrew equivalent of, r, of r. That's worth 200. And then, so that's kasar. And then we've got Nero, so that's the Nu. Uh, let's see, the Greek, le the Hebrew letter Nu is worth 50. And then again, you've got a Resh, and Resh is worth, Resh again is worth 200. And then you've got this Vav. Uh, that would have been the equivalent of the long O. And the Vav is worth 6. And when you add all that up, you get 616. Whoop, something's wrong. Well, actually, it's not the Hebrew form of the name, strictly speaking. It's the Hebrew transliteration of the Greek form of the name. Because notice the Hebrew translation of the Greek form of the name has this, has this yod up here. So it's not the Hebrew form of Nero. It's the Hebrew form of the Greek translation, the Greek form. And that adds up to, oh, it adds up to 676. What's, I told you it was supposed to be 666. What's the problem? Well, it turns out there's, there is at least one manuscript which has... Kasar, Caesar's name, written in this way using Hebrew letters. And this adds up to 666. Okay, so how convinced are you, based on this analysis, that Nero was the beast? I find the argument unconvincing. It is so contrived. It's the alternate spelling 
of the Hebrew trans transliteration of the Greek form of a Latin name. That's what we have to use in order to get 666. That is so artificial. If you're going to pull stunts like that, you can get 666 out of anything. You could probably manipulate the name of, I don't know, Madonna or Obama or just something, or George Bush or something goofy like that. You just pick the name, use a middle initial, spell the name a little bit differently. You can make anybody into the beast. You can use beast anybody's name if you're going to pull stunts like that. I find it completely unconvincing. The one way of putting it is, as Richard Guy said in the strong law of small numbers, there aren't enough small numbers to meet the many demands made of them. Another way of putting this is that coincidences happen. It's not at all amazing that if you perform these, if you perform these gymnastics on Nero's name in different languages that you end up with 666. That's not really so amazing. Okay, let's look at some other forms, uh, some of the uses of gematria. Uh, John 21, 11, Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. This was the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. This is, he caught many fish. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Does 153 have any mystical significance? Here's one interpretation. We have what are called triangular numbers. If you form little triangles, little pyramids of coins, uh, for example, or just dots in general, uh, you get what are called the triangular numbers. So the first triangular number would be 1, the second one is 3, the third one is 6. You add another row at the bottom, 4 of them, 4 coins, you get 10. Add 5 at the bottom, you get 15. Add 6 coins at the bottom, and you get 21, etc. The seventh triangular number is 28, and we keep going. It turns out that 153 is the 17th triangular number. Oh, and 17, ooh, that's significant because 10 is the number of commandments and 7 is the number of perfection. Why, that's got to be the significance of 153. Well, that argument is completely unconvincing. Do you know who advanced that argument? It wasn't some flake. It was Augustine. It's amazing that Augustine came up with this argument. Not that he thought that that must be the significance of 153, but even as a possible significance I feel of 153, I find that wholly unconvincing. I think, rather, the number was recorded because it was amazingly, an amazingly large number of fish. Not that if you pull apart 153 and note that it's the 117th triangular number. I don't think that's the significance at all. Here's another example of where gematria have been used, or maybe I should say misused. In Genesis 14:14, 14, 14, when Abram learned that his relative Lot had been taken captive, he called up the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. So, is, does 318 have any mystical significance? Well, here's one possibility. In the next chapter, uh, Abram complains that he has no descendants. Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. Well, here's the Hebrew form of Eliezer. And it turns out that if you use gematria to add up the Hebrew letters in Eliezer, you end up with 318. Wow! Isn't that amazing? 318 is used in Genesis 14, and in the very next chapter, 318 is, this, is what you get when you add up the letters in Eliezer's name. Is that convincing? I don't think so at all. I'm completely unconvinced. Again, same story. One respectable Bible commentator commented on Genesis 14:14, 14, 14, noting an observation of another commentator named Gervitz. Uh, 318 is the sum of the prime numbers from 7 to 7 squared. It's 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, 31, 37, 41, 43, and 47. Ooh, and 7 is the number of perfection. So is this significant? I think not. I think that's a totally artificial way of finding significance in 318.